May I have attention, please? Welcome. Welcome, everybody, uh, at the eighth edition of Professor Stanisław Wojciewicz Lecture. Uh, uh, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome the uh, Proctor of the Jagiellonian University, uh, Professor Stanisław Kistrin. Welcome, uh, welcome our dean and uh, uh, his deputies. Uh, welcome our guests from other universities and even from abroad. Uh, welcome everybody, but first of all, welcome our lecturer, Professor Lucas Farelli from Austin, Texas. Uh, I think uh, that uh, I have to um, say about uh, the lecture, uh, well, lecture and the lecture himself. Uh, concerning lecture, as you know, uh, he's one of the most uh, powerful contemporary mathematicians. Uh, he solved problem uh, that uh, for a long time uh, could be, couldn't be solved by mathematicians. Uh, let me just mention his uh, seminar work on Navier's talks equations, and uh, everybody of us knows that uh, full understanding of Navier's talks equations is one of the mm, clay uh, mathematics millennium problems. Uh, he is uh, widely known and recognized as a world leading specialist in. Uh, free boundary problems of partial differential nonlinear equations uh, with his collaborators. He authored uh, about 300 uh, scientific publications of the subject. So uh, such things couldn't be awarded. And let me mention some of these awards. Uh, maybe we start with show awards in May 14, uh, so uh, awards have been announced, three of them, and only one in mathematics, and just uh, this award came, it goes to Professor Louis Caffarelli. The official ceremony uh, to be held in uh, Hong Kong uh, on September 26. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, before that, there were some other very uh, famous awards. The Rolf uh, Schock Prize from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the Steel Prize for uh, Lifetime Achievements from the American Mathematical Society, and the Wolf Prize in Mathematics from the Rolf Foundations, and much more. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, well, this is exactly what uh, uh, fits in uh, our Luwajasiewicz lecture. As I said before, it is uh, eight editions. And in uh, this moment, it would be nice to recall uh, previous lecturers, uh, all of them of the level of show prices are Fields medalists. Some of them uh, really Fields medalists. Uh, they were Shink Tung Yao, Richard Hamilton, Bernard Malgrange, Neil Trudinger, Fernando Coda Marquez, Noga Alon, and Arthur Avila. And now is Professor Kafferli. The chairman of this session will be our Dean, Professor Zvonek. Uh, so uh, please proceed. Thank you for the invitation, for letting me speak. So I think that my role can be reduced to presenting Professor Loi Caffarelli once more. And uh, now we are listening to his talk. And the title would be Some Models of Segregation. Yeah, so please. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so well, it's a great pleasure for me to give this lecture. I, Managed uh, to 
Schmidt, Professor Lohasiewicz, through the Pontifical Academy, where we coincide several times. And after a long days of discussion at night, there are groups that form for dinner. And he was always one of ours. Uh, and so, you know, I really miss him in that sense. Uh, OK. So, um, so let me start with a few generalities about segregation, and then I will discuss more or less the, the main tools in mathematics that uh, are used in the theory and uh, give you some, some glimpse of some things we have been doing lately in that area. So if you look at any, you know, if you just Google it, uh, uh, there are two different types of compositions, right? One is uh, intraspecific, right, where um, the, uh, the, it's the same species that segregates itself. And I'm going to talk about some description of uh, phenomena uh, that has to do with uh, ants, that the ants are very aggressive, and they divide in groups and make their nest. And their nest, when the density is very big, it starts to take geometric forms. Uh, and then is uh, Interspecific, where are two, two uh, different uh, species that compete for the same area. And in this sense, I'm going to discuss a model uh, that involves uh, um, you know, mice and birds picking grain. And uh, you know, mice uh, just pick the grains which are in their way, and birds go far away. So they are represented by different diffusion processes. And so in, we had a study how that can be described mathematically. Uh, so mathematical models in the literature, there are two sort of predominant, right? One is based sort of in a, a, an agent system. I'm going to say what that is. And the other, which is the one that I'll discuss, is based on continuum dynamics. The agent system uh, basically is the idea. It's the same idea as... Uh, uh, um, as uh, <coughs> Uh, magnetization. So in the magnetization, there is this model where it said, you know, I look at the, you know, the particles and the magnetization goes up or down. There are two possibilities. And a particle that has positive magne mag uh, magnetization is surrounded by particles but that have a negative one, more, more than half of them, then it flips. Okay, and the, 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 the problem you find about segregation, which is related to this, is more or less the same idea. In other words, I have, OK, here the colors are a little bit faint, you know, but there are blues and reds, if you manage to, uh, I mean, um, yeah, sort of uh, blues and red. And the, what they do uh, in this uh, theory is this is more like a social uh, segregation theory. And so the idea is the following, right? You. Uh, so you are red, and you tolerate as more as, let's say, four greens are living around you. And if there are more than four greens, then you just move elsewhere. And uh, so with this simple law, they do, for instance, uh, this description. You know, you can look in the web the the um, the way that segregation takes place in Manhattan or takes place in in, in Los Angeles, and they give a sort of uh, interesting uh, you know, uh, results. So, but I'm not, not in that. I'm going to, I will more talk about segregation in, in sort of plants and, and birds and animals. And that is better defined by a sort of diffusion processes, OK? So, so let me tell you a little bit of, of the basics of the mathematics I'm going to use, right? So. Uh, Let's suppose we are, there is no competition. There is just one species and there. Then the time evolution usually is described by equations that uh, involve, involve uh, diffusion, transport, uh, <coughs> birth, and rate. I'm going to just restrict myself you know, to the diffusion. The other phenomena many times are negligible or many times are very complex. <laughs> and so, so I just will uh, stay with... Uh, what is more or less the classical approach, which is just a diffusion processes. Uh, so 
So the diffusion can be local or non-local, right? And linear or non-linear. So let me tell you a little bit what that is, right? And so uh, many of you will hear, right, that the heat equation or Brownian motion is represented by these equations, ut equal Laplacian u, where Laplacian u is uxx plus uyy plus ucc. And many years ago when I saw this formula, I had no idea <laughs> why was this diffusion. Okay, and so let me tell you that really the way to look at this equation is the following. Laplacian of u, right, you can write it as this limit. The limit of, so I'm, centering, I'm sitting at the position x, right, I'm looking at Laplacian of u of x, and it's the limit of the average of u of y minus u of x in a little ball, right, times r to the minus n plus 2. You can see that because if you make a Taylor expansion, right, if you want to do this, you do, it, do a Taylor expansion of y with respect to x, and the gradient is even, is odd. So the components of the gradient disappear, and the mixed derivative, u y, u y, u x1, u x1, u x1, x2, is also even. So in the average disappear, all that is left, if you do the, uh, the Taylor expansion, is, uh, is uh, the uh, sum of u y y, that is the pure second derivatives, times r to the, squ to the square. So you integrate the r square, and this is, you, with this n is like an average, right? And so you get basically uh, the, the ux, uh, u sub 1, 1 of x plus u sub 2, 2 of x plus u 3, 3, 3 of x times the integral of r that gives you the Laplacian. So the Laplacian, if you look at the Laplacian like this, then it's much easier to understand the heat equation of Brownian motion, because what is happening here is I'm standing at the position x, right? Let me see if I, I say, say yeah, no, okay. I'm standing at the position x, and I'm comparing myself with my surrounding, okay? And if the average of the surrounding is bigger than me, I try to, to fall into the average, to, to revert to the mean. In other words, if, if the average is bigger than me, that the Laplacian is positive, then I want to grow, and that's ut, right? The heat equation is ut equal Laplacian of u, which says I'm going constantly trying to revert to my surrounding, okay? And that's what makes the Laplacian such a powerful smoothing equation. In other words, you start with something which is very wiggly, and you compute the heat equation of that, and that instantaneously starts to smooth because the high points are trying to go down, and the low points are trying to go up, okay? So... Uh, so uh, what about non-local diffusion? Non-local diffusion is the same idea, but instead of comparing myself with what surrounds me infinitesimally, I have a much more range of information. Okay, so for instance, it's a, there is a, what is called the fractional Laplacian, Laplacian to the S, right? It's called, for instance, uh, Laplacian to the one half is it's called like that because if you apply it twice, you get the Laplacian, okay? And it's basically, the same idea, in other words, I am at the position x, but now I have much further away large range information. In other words, now I'm not comparing myself with my little neighbor who I'm making it go to zero. I'm comparing myself with everything, right, with a weight that depends on my interest. In this case, the weight, which is the fractional plus, and says what is close to me is much more important than what is far away. In other words, the constant of comparison goes to infinity when it's close to me, and to zero further away, okay? So, uh, so I'm going to uh, use uh, the Laplacian and the fractional Laplacian. Another observation, uh, if the Laplacian is positive, if the Laplacian is positive, it means that what surrounds me is bigger than myself. So if I have a function that, that, uh, u in some domain whose Laplacian is positive, going inside tends to go down, because point by point, what surrounds you is bigger, so in sort of, some sort of, it has some sort of convexity, right? So it's not exactly convexity, but it's some sort of convexity, okay? And so positive Laplacian is called a subsolution because it's below a solution, okay? Negative, negative Laplacian, the other way around, okay? So, uh, so, so much for non-local. Let me talk, so, so let me say a little bit about non-linear diffusions, okay? Nonlinear diffusions appear in optimal control, uh, in financial math, in segregation, in many areas, okay? And uh, um, the idea of optimal control uh, for nonlinear equation is the following. 
I suppose I'm in a random medium and I want to have an idea of what are the uh, least or largest possibilities. Okay, so suppose I am standing here, right, and I, have, I do a random walk and I want to know what is the probability I'll get the door, right? If the lecture is boring, you can try that, okay? And so it's, okay, well, but how, what is your random walk? If, well, if it's your random walk is always exactly circles, I get the Laplacian because I am get, I'm following the average, right? But suppose you tell me, okay, I let you design this, the, I let you design your, the, the, the floor, right, such that your uh, walk is, has a different length in different directions, okay? So mathematically, that's is saying like, the, instead of having the Laplacian, that is the sum of uh, UII, you have AIJ, UIUJ. In other words, if you, if you write that in the eigenvalues of the matrix A, means that at every point I have some, I, have, I can design the floor in such a way that, you know, which is longer steps in that direction of that direction to uh, uh, have the biggest chance or the lowest chance to go through the door, okay? So basically, if I want to see what is the biggest chance that I go through the door, right, I have to, uh, I have to, uh, I have to look at, at all the possible, I have to find a, fi a solution U such that I plug all the possible matrix A, which as I look, put all the possible tiles in the floor with some restriction, right? I cannot do a tile that goes to the, to the door and jumps through the door. So the restriction is that the tiles correspond to a matrix that has a bound below and above. In other words, your, your tiles can be of length between one and five in any direction, okay? So this is the same as saying I look at AIJ of, uh, of uh, AIJ, DIJ of U, okay? And if I want to, to see what is the smallest chance of going out, then I have to taste all possible tiles everywhere, and I have to take the infimum of all the possible solutions, okay? If I take the infimum of possible solutions, means that the function is a subsolution for any operator I put, okay? So it is, it goes, the probability goes down uh, with respect to any tiling I can do, okay? So my promise, my, 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 uh, my, what I have to do then is I have to find a way to solve uh, the problem, minimize among all possible elliptic equations that you can cook up, okay? And this seems sort of a, in principle, the first thing is, uh, this is a crazy thing. What, you have, what, what are you going to be able to say of that? So the first observation, right, is that you at least can write a nice formula for it because you can say, well, okay, the best configuration, the smallest one, right, is called a Pucci operator, right, and consists of the following. I have to find a function, u, right, such with the same following property. I take u, So, problem, For, find the following function. I take u, right? I compute the Hessian, d square of u. I separate the eigenfunction of the Hessians in positive and negative. Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda k positive. And the next one, k plus 1, kn negative, right? I have to multiply the positive by the smallest number lambda, okay, so here is lambda E1 EK, and the negative by a larger number, larger uh, positive uh, constant capital lambda, okay? And I have to find a function that when I do that, I get zero, okay? So this is still seems, seems rather wild, right, in other words, but at least has some better shape. Well, the fact is that there is a beautiful theory, right, the, done basically by Krilov, Safanov, and by uh, Evans and Krilov that says there is such a function, is unique, and is C to alpha. The second derivatives are held or continuous, so we really can compute the operator there. Okay? So, so, so this is sort of in a, 
short description the, the, the optimal control theory. Okay, so this is how am I going? Whoop, time can go back fast. Okay, so so basically this is the operator you want to solve, and you get this regularity theory. Okay. Now, as I said before, if there is no uh, segregation, these are just solutions of equation. So now the question is, how is the segregation a force in some sense of, uh, enter into the system? And the segregation enter into the system, what is called a penalization, penalization point, a penalization method, okay? The penalization method basically says the following. Uh, let me go back. So the penalization method consists on putting a right-hand side, which is very positive when U1 and U2 overlap. Okay? I told you as a little while ago that if you have the Laplacian with a positive right-hand side, that forces the function to go down. Okay? So if I have a function with positive right-hand side, and I, that, that I make the, the right-hand side very, very big when u1 and u2 are different from zero, this is going to pull the solution more and more, okay? So just to give you an schematic, a schematic 1D picture, right? To give you an idea what happens, then uh, you see, uh, if you just have u1 and u2, Laplacian of u1 and Laplacian of u2 equal to zero, right? That in one variable is uxx equal to zero, so you have two lines, right? In other words, you put boundary data, one here and zero there for the blue, one here and zero here for the rest, and they don't see each other, just are two lines, okay? If you put some moderate segregation, then they start to see each other, and they both bend down, right? Because both start to have a positive Laplacian. So this is like moderate segregation. And then if you let M go to infinity, then uh, when, when uh, then you, the set where you one and you two overlap, becomes zero. They cannot overlap because there, if not, you have an infinite thing pushing down, okay? So basically, at that point, the, the term M of U1, U2 just is, I have shrink into the zero point of both, and it's a delta Dirac delta there. Okay, so when M goes to infinity, then you end up with U1, which is, satisfies the uh, Laplacian of U equal to zero here, and U is zero here, and U2 satisfies Laplacian of U2 here, and it's zero there, okay? So this is a segregation, a strength segregation, and produces an interface, produces a free boundary that separates U1 from U2, or U from B, and that we want to know where it appears, how regular it is, how, uh, how uh, stable it is, okay? So this is sort of a scheme of the, uh, of the segregation theory, okay? So there is extensive literature, you know, Dancer, Hillstorm, Mimura are the first ones that propose methods of this type, right? In other words, to have a family of UJ and you put a penalization for every UI and UJ and study the model, okay? A few years ago, I started a collaboration with Fan Walin where we sort of advanced the, the, this theory considerably. Uh, Basically, uh, we introduce, uh, um, so, so we look, for instance, at a multiple segregation where you have a, a, a several species, right? And uh, some segregate with other, but not with everybody. And so there starts to be sort of common regions for one, common regions for another. Uh, and problematic thing. Another application we did was to harmonic maps. The harmonic map is a map, right, from what, but singular harmonic map is when you map in geometry a domain in a harmonic fashion, minimizing energy, into a family of disjoint lines. If you do that, right, in our words, harmonic map usually go from a nice domain to a nice domain, and then there is all the theory of geometry, but if you have take a nice domain and you uh, 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 map this into lines, in other words, the point here can go into this line or this line, then when they go into one line, they satisfy a nice equation. When you go into the other, también, but the, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there is some, some thing, some surface that separates the points going here from the points going here. 
Okay, and that has pretty much the structure of uh, of uh, of a segregation map. Okay. Okay. So so with Fangua, we introduce several methods. We prove we introduce a formula called Amgrim monotonicity formula, right? That allow us to show basically what happens with this uh, segregation uh, problems when you have several species is that there are some, some, oops, some regions where only two species uh, interact and then there you have a smoothness because the difference is harmonic, but then you have multiple points, okay? And using the, the Almgren uh, monotonicity formula and things like that, we managed to show that all the multiple points are sort of asymptotically cylindrical, cylindrical. In other words, and are not chaotic or very wiggle. In other, in the triple points, asymptotically here, this goes into three lines of, uh, of 120 degrees. And in more higher dimensions, it goes into sort of asymptotically, it's a cone. In other words, the, the, the transition surfaces are planes emanating from a point. Okay, so, uh, so uh, and another thing we have to do there is to rule out, this picture is not too good, but what we have to do is to rule out uh, to rule out the possibility of having u1 here, u2 here, and a very skinny u3 coming into between and ruining the whole theory. Okay, and so this is a delicate theorem where you show that if u3 uh, uh, is very small here and here then it decays in such a fashion that never reaches the origin, okay? So basically this was one of the many uh, problems. Okay, so uh, what I would like to discuss briefly now are three different models of segregation. One is segregation of a distance. Uh, the other is segregation in the case of optimal control. And the third is segregation involving local and non-local diffusion, okay? Uh, so segregation as a distance is... In fact, uh, it's a problem where the species have, uh, keep a distance from each other. Okay? I, also, I sometimes say, which is not too nice, it is like the war of trenches, right? When you, when the first war, when they did the war of trenches, the trenches were at some fixed distance from each other, right? And they evolve in that way, and it was sort of obviously a segregation. So, uh, Anyway, uh, you know, when we started working in segregation with Fangua, as a curiosity, I look at a bunch of papers, and there is this one that says precisely the, what I mentioned before, that uh, the ants, the, this is ants against ants. It's not two different species, ants against the same ants. And, uh, and they, they are very aggressive, and then they group in nests, and when the density is not too big, the nest, basically do not have a particular form, but as they, as they uh, explain, when the density starts to become very big, the nests become hexagonal and they are equidistant to each other. Okay? Uh, uh, so, so, okay, so basically we wanted to, to sort of try to, uh, let's say, reproduce or, or do some mathematical discussion of that, I must, I must report that I read that the only ants that do not fight are the Argentinian ants. And apparently in California, there are Argentinian ants' nests, which are enormous, that they go by kilometers because they don't fight and therefore it's a continuous of ants. So I don't know if it's good or <laughs> if one should be happy or sad for me, but anyway. Uh, so... Going, whoops, yeah, okay. So, so basically, this is a, a article I wrote with uh, uh, Stefania Patricia and Veronica Quitalo, right? Um, so basically, what we what we thought it was a reasonable type of uh, equation is the following, right? I take I have uh, the species uh, ui, and then the penalization is uh, ui of x times you can put the supremum of uj in a ball of radius epsilon or the average of uj in the ball of radius epsilon. Both things at the end have the same result. As epsilon goes to zero, 
right? This quantity has to go to, as epsilon goes to zero, right? This is the one over m of the things before. This quantity has to go to zero. They cannot overlap when the, when the quantity goes to infinity. And so both basically both penalizations have the same final objective, which is the soup in the ball of radius theta around a point where u i is positive has to be zero. And the other says the integral of the of u j in the set where u i is zero has to be zero. So basically both things imply that u j is zero in a ball a radius again the radius of uh, of basically. So so basically so basically uh, so let me tell you must more or less give you an idea of uh, of uh, uh, um, of how the theory went. Okay, so basically we wanted to build a solution. So basically the, the configuration more or less. that one should look at is the following, right? So here you have a domain, and let's say here there is one species, and here is another species, and here is another species, and their distance should be uh, bigger than the radius of, uh, of control. So it will be bigger than theta. If not, they have to, the boundary becomes MS. So, so, so you give initial data, which are things are distant from each other, okay? And then we use a fixed point theorem to show that the epsilon problem has a smooth solution, and the solution is Lipschitz independent of epsilon. And then you take a limit of a subsequence, and you get an object, right? And uh, you don't know much about that object, and that's what you want to describe. Okay, so so basically. Uh, um, let me say more or less the main steps on the theory. So you do the first step, right, and you find that there is some limiting function. Uh, you have a uniform convergence sequence because they are all uh, uh, held are continuous. They are all Lipschitz independently, so you can extract a sequence that converges to something, right? And then the first thing you can prove is that uh, if, let's say, uh, U1 is positive in this region and this point is on the boundary of positivity, then there cannot be U2 or U3 in the ball of radius epsilon. So this is clean of the other. And that is more or less immediate. What is much more delicate, curiously, is to show that in this ball there has to be at least one point in the boundary of U2. In other words, U2 cannot be, is not far away from this ball. There is at least one point here, right, which is in the boundary of the set where U2 is bigger than zero. Okay, and this has an enormous geometric... Uh, geometric um, consequence because that means that the set where u1 is bigger than zero has at every point a tangent ball from inside, outside. If we will have a tangent plane, that will mean that the set is convex. So this set is sort of almost convex, okay? Uh, uh, so this is the first observation. And then the second observation is that in fact, at every point, the solution has a tangent cone. In other words, you take, so the, the next observation, right, is, is you take at every point, all the points at distance. So you have your point, you have your ball of radius theta. Here U is positive, right? And then you take all the points which are at distance one and belong to another component. And then this thing is, is surrounded by this a bunch of different balls tangent to that point. You can show that the alignment of these balls is such that the cone associated to this ball is a convex cone. So your solution is com almost convex or quasi-convex everywhere. Okay? The next observation 
is that there is a balance between opposite points. In other words, if I have that the cones, you know, I have the, the tangent balls that generate a cone here, right? And then I have this ball of radius 1, right? So basically you could say, okay, here anything which is in this quadrant, right, can provide me with a tangent cone. And the answer is no. The answer is that if I have this, 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 this ball, then here the only points that, that appear are this one and this one. This will be in 2D, in more this, the same. In other words, this cone has here associated another cone and another cone. And this part is empty. Okay, so that means that the points in our boundary have uh, the, 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 the following geometry. In other words, you have, or you have a regular point, and if you have a regular point, then you have that, uh, the solution. So when the points are regular, the solution between two components are exactly at distance one, point by point, exactly at distance one, okay? And they are smooth, right? And in fact, you can prove that there is a balance between both sides. And the balance between both sides is that the product of the curvature, or the ratio of the, the curvature times the slope, right, is the same at both sides. In other words, if the mean curvature here is, is uh, bigger, then the density of population is uh, smaller. If you are like surrounded, in other words, if, you're, if your surface is the one with the more curvature, then the, the species here puts higher, uh, higher uh, densities, okay? So there is this perfect balance of densities, densities of times curvature for both sides. Okay, and if you have, if you look at the singular points, then the first thing to do, the first thing you can prove is that the number of singular points is finite. And the reason is the following, oops, the reason is the following, right? Along here, if you take distance to the one half, distance to the one half is a curve which is equidistant from the red and the blue because the distance is one. So distance to the one here, you have a line which is distance to the one half. But when you get here, distance to the one half of the red curves around, and distance to the one half of the blue curves around in the other direction. So that means that whenever you have a singularity, you have this extra region that belongs to nobody. And since the sum of the extra regions is finite, and the extra regions have positive, fixed positive density, the number of singular points is finite. Okay, so you have really this picture, which is as close as, you know, I, I here look at uh, squares that could be, uh, you know, ex, ex, hexagons in other words. You can have uh, uh, more, uh, more uh, uh, singularities coming to the same point, but they all are of equivalent uh, uh, angle. And they are all of equivalent angle because if the angle is bigger, then you have more resources. If you have a harmonic function, and you take an angle, and when the angle is very small, then the function decays like a big power. When you are in the middle, it's linear. When you are in between, the power changes. And the powers uh, here in, and in the opposite point has to be the same. So the angles basically have to be or this four, or six, or eight, or whatever. Okay, and basically that's as much as, you know, this is what we the description we gave for that problem. The second problem I wanted to discuss, okay, we are more, I may go to 510, but I think I started by 14 <coughs> at least, <laughs> okay. So the, the second one has to do with a model for fully, uh, for segregation of fully nonlinear equations. Uh, the, uh, this you can think of it as a, in a, a, as a problem of buyers and sellers, right? If you have uh, buyers, that buyers want to, to have a diffusion, uh, to find out what is the diffusion that gives you the smallest price, and sellers the one that gives you the largest price, right? And so, so this is a pro, as we see, I will mention before that you can apply what I say to the buyers and seller model. 
But if you want to think on, on sort of a natural segregation, a natural segregation will be the following. The, uh, if you have a, a plants uh, competing for light, right, and you are, let's say, a tree and surrounding trees, you are not worried about the trees which are shorter than you. You are worried about the trees which are higher than you, okay? And so you will have a diffusion process where the, which is exactly the full nonlinear, the, the part of the average which is bigger, you weight more than the part of the average which is smallest. And so you get like the optimal control equation, okay? So basically, in that, so basically, uh, uh, let me tell you what we, so, so, so this will be, it is a species, right? And if you have two different species, both of them can have the, the problem of competing for the sun with the surrounding, but also species like uh, trees have a way of segregating in the sense that the, the you know, the, um, uh, the, the, they have, they have, they, have chemicals that attack any other plant. There are trees that on the radius and corresponds to the roots, nothing grows, okay? So you can have a species that stay separate, which often happens, and at the same time, the way they grow, each one of them is through a fully nonlinear equation, okay? So basically, we have this optimal control fully nonlinear equations, right? And then what we, and then we do, here we do the standard, a penalization that is one over epsilon u1, u2, and then what you have is, uh, what you have is two adjacent domains, right? So you have this adjacent domain, and here you have, uh, um, you have here a species u1, and here you have a species u2 going up two, right? And in the middle, you take the limit, you have the delta, okay? Now, I'm both satisfied that, uh, let's say, F minus of d squared of u is uh, zero for both of them, okay? Now, uh, F minus of d squared of u, we are in that zero, right? Meant that the function was a solution for any operator. So in particular, these functions are subharmonic, okay? Both of them are subharmonic. Okay, and for subharmonic functions in adjacent domains, I wrote with uh, Alton Friedman a monotonicity formula that says that if you have two harmonic functions in an adjacent domain, right, this is u1 equal to zero, u2 equal to zero, uh, and here you have Laplacian of u1 bigger or equal than zero, Laplacian of u2 bigger or equal than zero, then there is an average, right, of something on the left and something on the right, which is monotone. I'm not going to, well, the average is something like in 2D, the average is the integral of gradient u squared in the, so I take here the disk of radius r, so I have the integral in the r of gradient u squared, right, one over r squared, right, uh, u one, times the one over r squared, the integral of gradient of u2 squared, this function is monotone increasing in r, okay? And the important thing of this function being monotone increasing in r is that when you go to zero, this product is bounded. But then you want to zero, this product converges to the normal derivative of u, because this I'm doing the average of the gradient squared. So this compute, when r goes to zero, this converges to u nu minus square and u nu two plus square. And this in, in, in every dimension, you can modify this and you get this into the limit. So this says that if you have two harmonic functions in adjacent domains, cannot be that goes, both of them goes to zero slowly, right? If one is very steep, the other is very flat. Okay, and this is a very powerful formula to study what happens across uh, surfaces when you have this situation. Okay, so in our case, we have that situation. Both are subharmonic, right? Uh, and therefore, the normal derivatives of both cannot be large. When one is large, the other has to be small, okay? And the other thing that you can observe 
is the following. If I take here the positive part, and then I flip the negative part, the penalization disappear, right? The penalization, because the penalization was just u1 times u2 over epsilon for both. So in other words, there is no penalization, but here the function satisfies one extremal operator, that f minus, right? When you put the large constant on the positive and the small constant on the negative, and here it satisfies the opposite. Large constant on the negative, because I flip it, small constant on the positive. So you have a, a, a sort of a strange thing where you have this fully nonlinear operator on one side that naturally continues to the opposite fully nonlinear operator on the other. And you wonder if still you can talk about regularity and so on. So, so all of this, what I described, was basically on the thesis of, uh, of Veronica Quitalo. Uh, uh, so, uh, and she showed then that, so when you have this situation, then you can show that on one side, this function is a solution on one side for the, for the well, what's the picture is really the other way around, right? It's like that and like that. This is sub-solution of one operator and solution of the other. And this is super-solution of one operator and solution of the other and vice versa. So there is a theorem of, of uh, the, the Harnack inequality of Krylov and Safanov that says that if you have a function which is super solution of, an, of a bounded measurable uh, coefficient and sub-solution of another one, although they are disconnected, the function satisfies Harnack inequality. Okay? And so what you can deduce here is that the the whenever there is a tangent plane for the other, there is the same tangent plane for the opposite. Okay, so you get light Lipschitz and that property. And so we retook uh, recently the problem. Uh, and we work, I work with Patricio, Kitali, and Torres. And then what we show is that if, you, if the u goes to zero faster than linear, goes faster than linear on both sides. And they are, you cannot say much there because it's very degenerate. But if one of them goes in a linear way, at most has to be linear because solutions are elliptic. So if one of them goes in a linear way, then both sides have a common tangent plane. Okay? So the solution is sort of C1 across the boundary. It's not exactly C1 because the tangent plane cannot, you don't know how it changes. And then the next thing we did is we proved that in fact the free boundary is C1 alpha when it's in, in a neighborhood when it's non-degenerate. In other words, if you have a point where the two functions come with non-degeneracy, then in a neighborhood of that, the free boundary is a C1 surface, and the two functions are C1 alpha, and they coincide with each other. Okay, so we get regularity of the interface and regularity of the solution. And uh, so this is what I just say. And um, this is what I just say. And then the way we do the free boundary regularities, we use a method that I developed sort of uh, 20 years ago or more, right? Which is, I call it the Harnack inequality approach to the regularity of free boundaries, where you take some sort of variable uh, averages and show that. Uh, Using this average, variable average, you can show that the oscillation of your free boundary in many circumstances gets smaller and smaller. So anyway, let me, uh, oops. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the third problem. So the third problem uh, uh, is this problem of uh, the interaction between local and non-local operators. In fact, I have been tra working a lot because I think it's a very sort of uh, interesting topic when you have um, uh, uh, two operators of, of, of different order uh, uh, interacting together, okay? So, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, one example is transmission conditions. Transmission conditions, no free boundary. You have a surface where two different equations comes together, and instead of having independent boundary data, they have a boundary data that connect them. Because, uh, U1 satisfies the Laplacian, UT satisfies another operator, and 
they are continuous across, and their normal derivative, the difference of the normal derivatives are one. This was a topic which was studied a lot during the 70s, uh, and it's a topic that appears a lot in, in applications where you know the separation surface, so it's not a free boundary, but you have some materials uh, on one side, a different material on the other, and they interact. And this, well, in the 70s was all two second order operators, and uh, uh, Dennis Krivenson, a student of mine, did a beautiful thesis where I told him, uh, you know, there is this, uh, the quasi-geostrophic equation. The quasi-geostrophic equation is an equation to estimate the temperature, how the temperature of the water and the ocean flows between, between air and water, okay? And so there is, this equation has been worked a lot. We work on the regularity theory. I work with uh, uh, Alexis Vasser to show regularity of solutions to the quasi-geostrophic equation. Then you go to the literature and says that in the water, the quasi-geostrophic equation is a half Laplacian. Laplacian to the one half because basically Laplacian to the one half is equal to the normal derivative. So it is that the that the temperature goes through the atmosphere. So the temperature here is modified by the temperature here through the at atmosphere. And so that is a Laplacian to the one half. But in land, for some reason, they decided that the, the temperature satisfies the Laplace equation. Okay? So basically, this is a transmission he studied, a transmission condition where it's a harmonic function on one side and the half harmonic on the other fit together. And he really did a beautiful thesis. Uh, um, another local non local interaction we study, I study with uh, Sabine and Da Silva, is the two membrane problem. The two membrane problem is the following it's a classical problem. Right? It is like if you, put, if you have a membrane, if you have a balloon here and another balloon here, and you press them against each other. If you press it against each other, then you have something like that, and like that, right? <coughs> and then these are like each one is an obstacle problem from the other. In other words, this acts as an obstacle from this and vice versa. And if both of them are, let's say, the Laplacian, then you can reduce it to an obstacle problem, take the difference, and basically uh, you use the standard theory. But we decided to look, you know, we... we uh, so, so, for instance, that will be two balloons. Now, if you have, I think in their letter, they gave this analogy many years ago. If you have a boy leg and you press it with a film, right, then this satisfies the Laplacian, but this satisfies the half Laplacian, okay? So you have the interaction of one against each other, but where they uh, uh, have a different... Uh, a uh, range of operators. And so with, uh, with uh, Savin and the Silva, we show regularity of solutions and regularity of the free boundary. It is that this regularity of this interface, the, the interface here is a curve, in more dimensions is a, is a lower dimension. Uh, anyway, so, so going to these local, non-local interactions, the, again, if I, you know, I, I keep looking at this uh, segregation problem, and, and there was, I don't know if I have, yeah, I have here the quote, right, where they, there was, a, this was just experimental. There was uh, people that put food every night uh, in, the, in the floor and measure, uh, the pay, have, have a way to measure what has been collected by, by rodents and one by birds, and they show that, you know, the, the rodents collected less, but in a very, concentrated way, while the birds concentrated, uh, collected less, but have a much range of collection, larger range of collection. And so, so we said, okay, let's look at the following. So basically, uh, we have the species one, right? So, so the parabolic equation of the species one and the parabolic equation of species two. Species one will be the birds here, and then they satisfy the fractional Laplacian, right? And species two will be the Laplacian. And they have the same uh, uh, interaction or, or penalization factor. Okay? Really, there shouldn't be penalization there. You know, I don't think the birds and the 
unless they are very aggressive. But, you know, we like preboundary problems and we like uh, this approach. So we said, okay, let's penalize the birds. Don't go into the region of the, of the uh, don't live in the region of the mice, and the mice don't live in the region of the birds. And so what would be the, the appropriate uh, uh, model, okay? And so uh, let me discuss for you what is the appropriate model, right? And then I'll say a little bit about the math, okay? So as before, you see, since, uh, so this is a stationary problem. As before, the penalization problem is, the term is the same. So if I make the difference between U1 and U2, Laplacian, half Laplacian of U1 minus Laplacian of U2 is zero because the penalization term has canceled, okay? So basically, we have that first observation, okay? The second observation is that when, uh, <coughs> when uh, that, uh, well, the second observation is that they are disjoint, right? Because of the penalization, uh, if, if large penalization, right? U1 and U2 cannot share a common place. So U1 and U2 are disjoint. U1 lives here, U2 lives here. So U2 lives here, right, and satisfies the Laplace equation. So when U2 is zero, the Laplacian of U2 is zero. So in this region, so U2 is here, it's Laplacian of U2 equal to something, here it is equal to something, and here Laplacian of U2 is zero. But if you have a non-local operator, the Laplacian of the non la fractional Laplacian of the non-local operator is still non-zero, when the operator is zero, okay? Because it's the integral against this kernel, right? I'm doing the integral like here, right? As I said at the beginning, to compute the half Laplacian, I have to do u of y minus u of x integrated by this kernel. In other words, u1 here is zero, but still this fractional Laplacian is strictly positive because this is u y is positive and u x is zero. What is the meaning of this? Is that U1 doesn't live here, but U1 can collect here because the Laplacian is that it collects, right? So the Laplacian to the one half of U1 here is not zero, okay? <coughs> so the Laplacian of U1 here, so U2 is, Laplacian is positive. Well, we don't know Laplacian here, but here Laplacian is zero. U1 has Laplacian zero here, because it is here is where it is a solution of the fractional equation, but here the Laplacian of U1 is non-zero, okay? So up to now we are okay. The next one is then that the Laplacian of U2 here is the Laplacian of U1 minus the fractional Laplacian of U1, because we have this condition that says that the difference is zero everywhere, okay? So basically, if you go back to this picture, here, the Laplacian of U1 is not zero because it's the fractional Laplacian of U1 is not zero. It's a strictly positive because it's Uy, which is positive, minus Ux, which is zero. So here is positive, and it's exactly equal to the Laplacian of U2 from the, previous, the, from the previous observation, that the difference of the operator is zero. So that means that U2 here has a non-zero Laplacian. It's not harmonic anymore. And the third observation is that U2 cannot form an angle here because the Laplacian to the one half of U1 cannot see a line. Laplacian to the one half is an integral of a kernel. An integral of a kernel in a set of dimension zero is zero, which means that Laplacian of U1 here has no mass, and that implies that Laplacian of U2 here has no mass either. Therefore, the solution of this problem has to satisfy that here I have U1 is fractional Laplacian equal to zero here, uh, and fractional Laplacian of U1 equal Laplacian of U2 here, strictly positive. And U2 satisfies Laplacian of U2 strictly positive here, equal to Laplacian to the one half of U1, U2 equal to zero here, and the gradient of UT or the normal derivative of U2 has to be identically zero on this line, okay? So <laughs> notice that, in some sense, this is saying that what U1 collects in this region, right, which is his half Laplacian, U2 loses it, okay? In other words, 
Laplacian of U2 positive means that U2 went down, right? So, 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 okay, so we wanted to prove existence, so we prove existence for this, uh, for this configuration. Uh, this is what I just discussed. So, basically, this is the final picture. Let's say this is minus Laplacian of U1, and uh, so we did it, we work in a strip. You know, you take, oops, because it mathematically simplifies a little bit the things, right? So, we said, okay, we have this strip here, the density of the birth is one, and the density of the rodent is zero, here the other way around. Here is the mixing area, we have the interactions, and we have our free boundary. We have proved that the free boundary is Lipschitz, that uh, uh, solutions are smooth, and have some work on the free boundary, but no, I think, let me stop here, because from here on it becomes uh, somewhat involved. So, so I guess this is basically what I was saying. Uh, there is, okay, this is more technical. You can, the half Laplacian of, of a function, you can, you can uh, describe by making a harmonic extension and looking at the normal derivative. In other words, the Neumann data is the same as the half Laplacian, and that allows you to say a bunch of things which I'm not going to enter. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks very much, and I invite you to say words or comments. Yeah. Uh, if I can, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is more, is more maybe more vague. Uh, you understand to say that uh, particle creation annihilation is a phenomenon can be understood as segregation, but I don't. Well, that's what I felt, you know, I got to segregation because Bursley, which is a probabilist in Washington State, in Washington State, came and said, okay, I have this system of particles that they are in two domains. When they get into a contact, they, they, annihilate, they annihilate each other. And I asked him, well, how, how is the balance there? And he told me exactly the balance of, of the segregation. I have a density of particles coming from the right, the density of particles coming from the left. In the parts where they are free, they satisfy the diffusion equation. And when they hit, they kill each other. And so I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, the right model is you have that the two normals are the same. And, uh, and that's, and this is, but the, this is the classical, it's not, you know, this apparently is a classical model or particle segregation. This is all I can tell you. Yeah. Can I have a second question? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, when you're talking, uh, I saw many uh, geometric properties, many uh, integrals, but uh, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, put in my head the full picture what you need to uh, uh, know from mathematics to mm, do with this model, because uh, I just don't know what, sh what is the model what uh, other branch of mathematics are connected to this uh, research. Can you say some, a few words about it? Can you make the question a bit more concrete? Uh, I don't know. Differential <laughs> geometry or uh, uh, theory of integrals, what uh, they are involved here, yes? Oh, what they are the techniques that uh, are involved? Well, I mean, there are a bunch that I collect. No, I started with the obstacle problem like uh, 45 years ago. And there you have to develop uh, some, some bunch of estimates and discover uh, the geometry. Usually, is, you know, you have the equations are not uh, uh, wild equations. Like the obstacle problem is the Laplacian. And the, fact, the obstacle problem, let me tell you, for instance, if you look at the obstacle problem, which is one of the classical problem, right? So the obstacle problem, right, is you have an obstacle, right, and you lower a membrane, and the membrane uh, touches here and touches here, right, and here you don't expect the membrane to, by rational you show, you don't expect the membrane to go out at an angle, right, the membrane will be tangent. So basically, let's say that the Laplacian of this is, let's say, minus one, because it's bended like that, right, 
So if we could say, as a first approximation, the obstacle has Laplacian of obstacle equal to minus one. So what we have here is a surface such that Laplacian of U is PR zero because it's the approximation of a membrane that is not forced in any direction. Here, the Laplacian of U is one, right? And across the interface, there is the Laplacian of U doesn't have a positive sort of distribution, okay? And then you want to show that the membrane, is, the solution of the membrane is C11. That is because you say, okay, second Laplacian here is bounded, Laplacian here is bounded, this doesn't look too bad. Optimal regularity C11, and that was proven by Brazis many years ago. And then you say, okay, I want, to, I also would like to show that the, that the, you know, some stability of the set and some regularity of its boundary. In other words, you're, you expect the, you know, you expect the, the, the shape to be stable because the Laplacians are different. If, if you will have the Laplacian of the obstacle will not be strictly negative, then the things can, I, can, I can always cheat, right? I can give you this obstacle and you have uh, the surface and then I say, okay, I just change your obstacle and I make it touch here in any set I want. So your theory is broken, right? Because then, I, then the contact set is anything you want. So, so there is some non-degeneracy condition that tells you that the contact has some clear differentiation, right? And then you have to try to discover what are the properties. So the properties, for instance, that I discover is that if you take this point and you make a sequence of dilations, then the difference becomes, is convex, okay? And if the difference is convex, that tells you that the contact set is convex. So all of a sudden, you have that your, the boundary of your contact set is convex. That's a lot of information, okay? And then you prove that this set that is convex cannot be strictly convex because then the extension of a harmonic function is not C11. So it has to be a plane. And you have, so you have to discover, you know, uh, what are the geometric properties of your problem. You have, you know, you have to invent, you know, you have to discover what's going on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, more. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, also, are there any numerical simulations on these models, especially? Uh, yeah. Well, sir, the obstacle was created as for numerical simulation. Just you know, in the in the early '70s, right? There was a numerical it was a group of numerical analysts all over that started to develop sort of uh, um, sort of mathematical. Uh, estimates of numerical simulation was uh, Jack Williams, uh, Babushka, uh, uh, I don't know, a host of people from that time. And one of the first problems they studied was the obstacle problem because it was, they studied problems where, you know, they knew how to solve equations, but they started to look at problems with constraints. In other words, the obstacle problem is a minimization problem, energy minimization problem in a convex set, right? In other words, instead of minimizing energy, if you minimize energy, uh, uh, put, uh, put in boundary data and nothing else, you get the harmonic functions, right? And then the, the numerical analyst knew how to triangulate and so on, okay? But then says, okay, let's look at how to do numerics in problems with constraints. And there is a long literature all through the 70s that uh, they did like a torsion of a bar. There were a lot of different problems and we are, there was a constraint, usually a convex constraint. For, to do numerical analysis, if the constraint is not convex, it's much more complicated. You know. There is some loss of uh, How about yeah. this uh, models, this new models that you have been developed? Uh, the, for segregation, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of numerical uh, work. For the model, for these models, there is some people in, uh, 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 in uh, Sweden, I think, that have done some, some uh, they, they send me some, 
some, you know, some, some picture, basically. So I, I don't know how deep they work or anything like that. Yeah. Any more questions? How did you have in mind what you were saying about local and non-local interactions? Well, it was the interaction between a, a local diffusion and the non-local diffusion, the non-local diffusion being the fractional Laplacian, that is where the diffusion is expressed by a Levy process in some sense, right? And so, so I think there are many interesting cases where you can see how a Levy process and a second order operator interacts in a non-trivial case where you have this. Pardon? Non-local is non-trivial. <laughs> non-local is non-trivial, but you know, you have to advance, you know. Any more questions, remarks? If not, then I wanted to thank one more, our speaker. Thank you. And I think that we may close this lecture. Yeah, thank you very much.